If you have a Bible, turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Those things in the bulletin that you see as far as events and programs, anything immediate, you can pretty much just X off at this point um, and for that. So just be in prayer for all this stuff as we walk through these times and these crazy times in which we now live and do these things. I want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to begin in verse 6, actually, with our focus on verse 16. Paul says this, We do, however, speak a wisdom among the mature, but not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. On the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom God predestined before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom because if they had known it, they would, have, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human heart has conceived, God has prepared these things for those who love Him. Now God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit, since the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except his Spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who comes from God, so that we may understand what has been freely given to us by God. We also speak these things not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. But the person without the spirit does not receive what comes from God God's Spirit, because it is foolishness to him. He is not able to understand it since it is evaluated spiritually. The spiritual person, however, can evaluate everything, and yet he himself cannot be evaluated by anyone. Who has known the Lord's mind that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ." Father, thank you for this time in worship and time in your word. Lord, I pray that I would decrease and you increase. Lord, speak to our minds and to our hearts. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been doing this little series called Incarnational Life. And part of the incarnational life is to have an incarnational mind. To understand completely, uh, to be incarnational is to be like Jesus. It's to be Jesus. It's to be Christ-like. And in order for us to be able to do that, we have to have His mind as well. That's what's great about 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It says, you and I have the mind of Christ. That word mind is a word that means that that's the part that's responsible for one's thoughts, for one's feelings, and one's reasoning. One's way of thinking about how they live life and how they make decisions in life and how they do things in life and how they view the world. And for us as followers of Jesus, to be Christ-like, we must have, must have a Christ-like mind. Amen. So how do we do this? How do we understand this? Because it says we have it. It's going tie, this will tie completely into what we talked about last week, and it's just a logical conclusion. Last week we talked about how the Spirit is in us. Christ in you, hope of glory. You can be Christ-like because Christ is in you. Well, not only do you have Christ in you that way, but you have Christ, if you have Christ in you, you have Christ mind in you as well. How does that take place? That is by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. And Paul explains this, and, and back in uh, chapter 2, verse 4, he says, My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Now, Paul, is what he's saying here, he's like, look, I, I'm an educated guy, and he was religiously educated, he was a well-educated man, 
And yet all these things and all these things that we know about Paul, all these things, the ways that we view Paul, and Paul says, you know, I don't speak from that well. I don't speak from that base. I speak from what the Holy Spirit says through me. That's why it's powerful. My religious education doesn't make me pow- my words powerful. My ability to argue and logic against and debate other people doesn't bring power. It's the Spirit speaking through me that brings power. Now, we've talked about this before, that we have to have uh, these things in Christ-like mind, and it's a demonstration of the Holy Spirit. See, our ability to communicate and our ability to understand the thoughts and wisdom of God only comes if you know Jesus. And if you know Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in you. So if the Holy Spirit is in you, and if you're going to tell me you're a Christian, then He is, then you also have His mind in you as well. Not only to communicate, but to understand the things of God, to understand what, how God views things, to understand how God sees things, to understand God's perspective on our decision-making process. This is why he says this in Isaiah. He just quotes Isaiah 40, 13, where it says, Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or who gave Him counsel? Isn't it funny how we like to debate God as if we can win? <laughs> and how we think that we know God so well that we can uh, articulate and tell Him how things should be? I mean, isn't that really how our prayers are sometimes? We, we define the answering to our prayers by God doing exactly what we think He should do. And we feel like we can tell Him on all these things, and we can tell Him how this should work out, and this, is, this will be the best way to handle all these things, and, and we all say, well, we all do this. But is that really how God wants to work? Well, you don't know unless you have a God like mine, a Christ like mine. The way God does things, most of the time, is not the way we would do things. We want things to be easy and simple and require less effort. God tends to work in the exact opposite direction because He wants you to trust in His power in you in order to accomplish those things which He wants you to do. And if you don't know that in your mind, then you won't live it out in your body. So to sit there and say you have Christ in you and to say I don't have Christ's mind is a contradiction in terms. They're, they're inextricably, no more than your brain is connected to your neck. Christ's mind is connected to His body. You have the ability to understand, to think, and to process the things of God. This is an incredible truth that we all need to understand as followers of Jesus. So how do we do this? It's a question. It's like, okay, I have this mind. How do, I, how do I develop this mind? How do I get this mind? Well, you already have it. How do I appropriate it? How do I apply it in my life? Romans 12, 1 and 2, one of the most important passages in Scripture to really understand this idea of having Christ's mind in you. He says this, Paul says, Therefore, Brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Stop right there. What do I have to do? Romans 12, uh, verse 1 there, Paul's using some very Old Testament kind of language. You see, you have to realize that in every single day and everything, the only thing that you as a follower of Jesus have to offer to God every single day is yourself, period. And every day you have to get up and I have to get up and we have to say, God, here I am. I sacrifice my will, my intentions, what what I like, what I don't like, and I give it over to you. And notice that that's first before the next part. And so every single day, we all have to get up and make this cognizant decision to say, not mine, but yours. Offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. That's your true worship. It's not our... "Ah." You only do that if you... You should only do that if you've worshipped and giving yourself over. We can express our worship, but let's just talk about what it really is. It's a, it's a giving of ourselves 
to God. Then it says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. That's a, a constant thing. So in order for my mind to be not conformed, I've got to offer myself as a living sacrifice. And when I do that, then, then this transformation that has already taken place is appropriated, and it renews my mind. Mind That word there for transformed and all that, that whole phrase we're doing, think of Jesus' transfiguration. If you remember the transfiguration, he's up there and Moses and Elijah show up and Jesus is having this conversation with, with them. And all of a sudden, the Bible says that he, uh, the, his glory starts coming out. The word is what we get our word metamorphosis from. That's the word here that, the, that, that Paul's using. And literally what it says is that it's, it's like straight out of a horror movie. It's that his glory came out of his flesh from the inside out. It wasn't like his glory came upon him. The glory came out of his flesh. Why? Because the glory was already in him. And guess what, you and I? The glory is already in us. His mind is already in us. So as we put this flesh to the side, we allow the Spirit to transform us and renew us and shape us. Why? Why do we want to do this? I mean, this is really important. You can only do this with the power of the Spirit. So that, because this is what we want. We want this is what we want. We all want this. You may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. What's God's will for my life? Oh, pastor, I don't know what God's will is for my life. I struggle to find out what God's will is for my life. I don't know what he wants me to do and, 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 you know, and how all these things. I get this all the time, and, and you got to understand, and I get, I get the question. We all struggle with these questions, but God's will to be discerned is only discerned through a renewed mind Amen. and a spiritual mind. To do the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. What's good about it? Because God's will is for you to become more and more like Jesus. That's what the good is. What is pleasing? Pleasing is living the way and thinking the way and doing things the way God wants us to do them. That pleases God when we live life the way He wants us to live it. And it's perfect because we are a demonstration of the perfect will of our God in our lives, which is good and pleasing. We demonstrate these things as we submit ourselves and allow the Spirit to work in us, and allow His mind to appropriate the way we live life and how we think about life. It's, it, Christianity is not hard. The things that we need to do to develop these things and to do these things have not changed for 2,000 years, and they won't change 2,000 years from now. How do you offer yourself as a living sacrifice? I mean, have you ever wondered about the, it talks about how it's foolishness to this. You ever wonder why people think how we do and what we worship and what we do is foolish? They do. The world thinks it's foolish. Why do you pray? Praying doesn't do anything. A foolish person says that. Why? Because they don't have a spiritual mind. Why do you spend all that time at church? Why do you give the church all that money? Some of you. Some of y'all can use a little hat. Why don't you just hate that person? They treated you like dirt. Why do you pray for a person who, who treats you that way? That person's a liar. Why? I mean, God doesn't care about them. Our minds are supposed to reflect that, and the reason we do it is because we understand spiritually. How can I read the Bible and understand it and, and, and have cognizant reading to do this? Well, you have to read it, first of all, to do it. But God gives you a spiritual mind to understand spiritual things. So i got to ask you, I say, I read, man, Pastor, I read Leviticus, and I just can't figure it out. Did you get past the first page? The Spirit will help you to understand these things. Being in small groups and, oh, Sunday school or Acts class or something to help you to understand and study together is, is valuable. Why? Because it helps you to develop your own spiritual mind. 
We now live in a, 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 a valley where every student's going independent study, basically, in this school districts, aren't they? Because they're not going to be in school for the next few weeks. We'll see what happens with all that, right? With this, you know, it helps to be in learning environments where we can learn together and, and to do those kinds of things. So this is, these are the things we have to do. We have to engage in the things that, that matter to God. God's pleasing will is for you to engage in those things. So when somebody comes to you and says, uh, man, why? And you buy that, you've got to ask yourself, well, you've got to get that out of your head. You know, most of us know how God wants us to do it. We all, most of us know what God blesses and what He doesn't bless. And when we choose to, and because we have that in our mind, and it's in our conscious, we do right and wrong, and we're not using our minds, we're using our own flesh. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. You have to have the Holy Spirit in order to have a Christ-like mind. Now, what are six characteristics of a Christ-like mind? It's kind of important. I mean, what does this look like? You just told me how it is, how to get what is what does it look like to have a Christ-like mind? Well, the first of these is life. Romans 8:38, I'm sorry, 8:6. Now the mind set on the flesh is flesh. Is, is, uh, on the flesh is death, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. And we'll get to peace in a moment. Life. People ought to be able to see us as followers of Jesus living out life, even in the midst of the chaos and the storm that we're living with around us, and they ought to see that we still have life. We ought, we ought not to be walking around looking like a bunch of cadavers. The mind of Christ does not walk around like a cadaver. And so we have to, you know, that people should see that. That's the opportunity that we get in the midst of storms and trials of life. It's so funny, you know, as I was sitting there, and, and some of you have actually probably done this as I was in the State of Brothers Wars uh, there on Friday. It's just, just talking and hearing people, hearing people. Man. Are you just trying to understand their mindsets for all of these things? And... Their, their, their preservation of whatever perceived life they have, and the reason they're stocking up is because they, the life they want to live is now being taken away from them, and they're afraid everything else is going to be taken away from them. And they're acting stupidly. I mean, when you start mugging old people for cases of toilet paper, you have a problem. That's true. When you stock up on Purell so that other people don't have any and you have to, have to pay you $12, which is illegal, first of all, so that you can profit, that's depravity at its core. We should be life. We should show life. We should show, be responsible, be practical, but also be life-giving. That's what the mind does. It should be, it's a focused mind. 2 Corinthians 11.3, Paul says, But I fear that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your minds will be seduced from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Well, let's just be honest, folks. For all of us, this is the biggest, hardest part of living life in the 21st century. We can't focus on nothing. And part of that is promoted by the sheer fact that while well, most of us in this room have this little rectangular device that, that dictates everything about us, from what time we're supposed to be where we're supposed to be, to what we read. For the, some of you in here, to, for what you eat, everything is in here. I'm the same way. I have 17, well, 15 years of sermons at my disposal anywhere in the world on my phone. All of them. And we're dictated by that. And our focus is on that. Well, this thing is just an exercise and distraction, right? Come on, let's all be honest. We go from Facebook to email to Instagram, and depending on where you're at in your social media skill set, Snapchat, TikTok, whatever else. And we have a hard time focusing on the things that matter to God. 
and they don't change. Focusing on Him, His power, His presence, doing the things He wants us to do, loving Him, loving our neighbor. And we just focus. Our kids are, and the funny part about it is, and you know, <laughs> all, of, all of us with our, our kids with their cell phones, right? And, and we got them there, and, and we want them to focus in school, but then we text them while they're in school, and if they don't answer us back within the next 30 seconds, boy, you are blowing up their phone like there is no tomorrow. And, you're, and, you, and then you get mad at them when they sit there on their phones, and they're texting and blasting their friends at no end, but expecting an instant answer, and you say, get off your phone, and they're like, we're just following you, Mommy. We're so easily distracted. We can, and this is the you know, Corinthians point and Paul's point. There are so many things in the world that can distract us from the things that matter most to God. And we, we have to do that here in our world today. We have to remember that God is in charge. God is ruling. God wins in the end. We have to keep our focus on that in the midst of the trials and the storms. Because the world isn't going to do that. We shouldn't function and behave in that way. We ought to show calm. We ought to show peace. We ought to show life and not be scared of our own shadow. Life, focus. It's a life of humility. It's a, humil- it's a humble mind. Philippians 2, 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. The Christ-like mind is a humble mind. It's not, it's not sitting there and promoting your weaknesses. It's being honest about who you are and li- focusing on your strengths to do what God has called you to do. It's putting others ahead of yourself. And part of the reason we're doing all the things that we're doing in that little letter we sent out to you is because there are people at different spiritual walks and different spiritual places, and there are people who are greatly concerned, and we ought to be do our part in doing that. It's putting others ahead of ourselves in how we live life. So that's a lot of why we're, we're doing what we're doing. They're being asked by the government to do this. And let's just thank God that he's allowing us to be a community that where we can still meet. Um, I mean, many, many a pastor today is, is probably literally in a suit in his, in his underwear preaching to, <laughs> to his community. But uh, there are a lot of guys that I know that they got, they got their little praise team up there and they're going to get up and preach and they're going to preach to a bunch of empty chairs. But that's just what they have to do. It's not right or wrong. It's just what it is. And so we need to be grateful and focus on the blessings that God has us. Humility. Be humble about it. Think about other people. And so that's why we do the things like handshaking. I mean, I'm, I'm a handshaker. I'm a hugger just like everybody else is. Well, we shouldn't do that. It's hard. I touch my face. We all touch our face. I wish that lady never said anything to me. And I should probably, I, you know, you almost dread putting that kind of warning on people because now you're going to sit here and you're sitting there and you're going to go, and you're just going to sit there and start counting and become, and you lose focus. <laughs> on how many times you're, you're touching your face. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a mind of life. It's a mind that's focused. It's a mind that's humble. And it's a mind that's pure. Titus 1.15, to the pure, everything is pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. In fact, both their mind and conscience are defiled. This is always one that we don't like to really talk about because this is the one that gets into the heart, depths of our hearts, and it is a, a, a habit thing that we have to think about. And, you know, I remember as a kid, what you put in your mind does matter. As adults, what we put in our mind does matter. When we were young, like our kids, we were arrogant enough to think that we could put anything in our mind that doesn't, doesn't affect our mind. They, they're going to think that. They still think that. We probably still think it was some of the stuff that we watch now on Netflix and Amazon Prime and all the other feeds and some of this stuff. We say it doesn't get into our mind. We're just watching it for entertainment. Oh, I just listen to the music. I don't listen to the words of the song, but I don't hear you humming the music. I hear you quoting the songs. And all I can do is get Charlie to go up here and play a lick or Jason to get up and play a lick and you won't start humming the tune, you'll start singing the words. So we have to be very careful about what we put into our mind and make sure that uh, you know, Christ, Christ's mind is a pure mind. 
We all deal with this. This is struggle. But just know that when we choose to fill our minds with stuff that Christ wouldn't put in his mind, know that that's not Christ's mind doing it. Right? Everybody's going to go cancel their Netflix descriptions now. Right, I believe that. (laughs) But it's pure. It's a responsive mind. Luke 24, 45, Paul, or I'm sorry, Jesus says this, then he, op- or, then he opened their minds to understand the Scripture. Actually, Luke says it about Jesus. This is the road to Emmaus. I love this story. I, this story is great. It's just, they're walking along, they're talking about events, and all of a sudden Jesus just shows up. They don't know it's Jesus. Jesus says, what's the big deal? And they look at him like, you've been hiding under a rock, dude? This guy, Jesus, crucified, and man, all kinds of wacky things have been happening since then. And, and then it says all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they recognize who he is. Why? Because all of a sudden their carnal mind became a spiritual mind as Jesus revealed himself to him. And he began to explain to them everything. He didn't put a Bible in front of him. He just explained the entire New Testament to him orally. Why? Because a spiritual mind can hear the Spirit and understand spiritual things. So it's, it's a responsive mind. It's responsive to the things of God. And then finally, it's a peaceful mind. It's a peaceful mind. You guys know this passage, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Paul says, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. Every mom in the world fights this verse. Every mom in the world puts a yeah but to this verse. But there is no yeah, but. Don't worry about anything, but you can worry about your kids. No, that's not what it says. It says don't worry about anything, but in everything. And you can look it up in Greek. Everything means everything. Through, how do we do do this? Instead of worrying, pray. Well, I do pray. Are you worried when you pray? That's kind of two forces. That fall. The mind of the flesh worries. The mind of the spirit prays. We, and petition. How do we do that? With thanksgiving. Thank you, God. It's 9.45, and they just texted me for the 20th time in the last 20 minutes, let me know they're okay, and thank you, and thank you, and thank you, and then 10 o'clock, and then all that stuff. Present your request to God. Are we thankful for what's going on in our world today? It says, make your prayers with thanksgiving. We have a lot to be thankful for. Just to keep running with the theme of, of, of everything, I'm thankful that I didn't need to go get toilet paper, quite honestly. <laughs> or hand sanitizer, although I probably should. We just sung that song, God is so good. Is he good? He's good. You've been good to me. He's still good to you. He's still good to me. We'll get through it. We'll be fine. We'll be smart. We'll trust in Him. We'll pray about it. It always amazes me how we think worrying is a better use of our time than praying about it. Well, prayer doesn't work. Neither does worrying. Worrying doesn't work. It just makes you a looney tune. Makes me a looney tune. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, 
will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Why are people buying 8,000 rolls of toilet paper and 18 million packs of chicken? Because they're afraid. They're being told that they may not be able to leave their houses forever. Some of the crazy loony stuff that's going on out there. And then it becomes a snowball in itself. Well, if a thousand people are going to buy toilet paper, but I better be able to get what's left so that I don't run out, right? And it just snowballs on itself. And that's what worry does. That's what having no peace does. It just, it just builds on itself. One thing leads to another, to another, to another, to unhealthy life. The mind of Christ does not allow you to get there because it understands and you understand that peace isn't there, it's in Him. So how do we get this mind? How do we develop a Christ-like mind? Three, three simple things. Set your mind on things above. Colossians 3, 2 says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. See, all the stuff that we're going and doing to try and take care of this physical problem is earthly stuff. And the mind of Christ focuses on the mind of God, because it is the mind of God, and that is the mind that you and I have in us. So you can think like Jesus, you can respond like Jesus, you can set your mind on those. How do I do those things? They don't change. They haven't changed. It goes all the way back to Acts chapter 2. It's, it's worshiping. It's in His Word. It's sharing. It's ministering to one another. It's encouraging one another. It's living the life that God intended us to live in community and being the church. Those are the ways that you grow in your mind. It does, it's never going to change. Then you've got to allow God to renew your mind. We already talked about that. I'm not going to spend too much more time on that. But you've got to allow God to renew your mind. And the only way you allow God to renew your mind is to sacrifice your body every single day. And we've already talked about that. That's never going to change. Every day when you get up, you make choices. They're either godly choices, they're either Christ-like choices, or they're not. It's that simple. And then we've got to be, have a ready mind. 1 Peter 1.13, Peter says, Therefore, with your minds ready for action. If you have an older translation, it says, Gird your minds for action. Literally, the idea of that was the Roman soldiers and those guys in those robes, they would gird up their robes so they could freely move around and, and do with the things that they needed to do. You have to have your mind ready for action. Be sober-minded and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You got to be ready. How do I get ready? Guess what? Same thing. It goes back to what Paul says back there in Ephesians 6 when he talks about the armor of God. You have to put on the armor of God. Not only do you have to put it on, you have to know how to use it and what it's for. And I, teach, I try and teach spiritual warfare that way because it's a practical way to look at this stuff. This, folks, isn't a bunch of Frank Peretti novel, This Present Darkness, or Tim LaHaye's little <laughs> spiritual stuff. That's all happening in the principalities and the powers of the air. But, folks, to put on the breastplate of righteousness is really simple. To make right choices in light of God's Word. Period. That is all it is. To shod your feet with the gospel of peace is simply just to have your feet in, in stance. You stand on the gospel. At the end of the day, the gospel will keep you firm. You've got to remember, the armor of God isn't about retreating. It's about standing where you are and then moving forward. Roman soldiers did not retreat. They went forward. You've got to be ready. You've got to put it on. How are you going to use a sword? You don't want me using a sword. I don't want me using a sword. Well, they had to know how to use a sword. The sword is the Word of God. If you don't read it and appropriate it and put, put your mind on things. You know, how many of you really know Jesus is going to want you to read this? Why? Because this helps to make you more like Jesus. 
What's his goal? To make you like Jesus. What is his good will for your life? To make you like Jesus. What is his pleasing will for your life? To make you like Jesus. What is his perfect will for your life? To make you like Jesus. So that we can go and do the things that he's called us to do. You've got to be ready. This thing that we're dealing with now with this COVID stuff, we weren't ready for it. So now we respond in panic. See, the Christian doesn't have to respond in panic because we're already prepared for what's to come. We already know. And we already know the result. See, that's one of the problems too as well. We all sit here and walk around. I had this conversation while so I was late coming in here uh, with a, a guest who was here this morning. And, and they were just you know, talking about spiritual warfare. And I'm just like, that. if you walk around in this life, in this world, thinking that God and the devil are at odds with one another, that somehow the devil can beat God, you just don't know the Bible. The devil isn't about defeating God. He can't do that. What he is about is getting in your head to defeat you. And the battle, folks, is in here. Everything starts here. I can't do this unless here told me to do this. So if you're going to sit there and say, if Jesus in you, but you don't think like Jesus, because your actions will dictate whether you think like Jesus, you're contradicting yourself and your own spirituality. So you've got to be ready. So now Jesus and Paul don't leave us here all by our lonesome as we talk about this, and I need to wrap this up because I've got to get ready for, for, for the next, next service. Pray for me. I'm, I'm going to be preaching in the Spanish service uh, this morning as well. And so, uh, no, I'm not going to speak Spanish. I'm going to let Carlos do that for me. Go ahead and put up Philippians 2. Adopt this same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Where does attitude come from? Right? Who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity, and when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God of God the Father. Jesus showed you what his mind looks like. He lived out how the mind thinks, what the mind does when it thinks like him. The Holy Spirit has been placed in you. He has been placed in you by as, a, as a down payment of the salvation and grace that we have received so that we can go around and we can live life the way Jesus lived life as his example from the Gospels and what Paul has described right there so that we can go have this incarnational life and it requires this incarnational mind. Amen. All of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus have his mind. And the mind is a terrible thing to waste. Amen? Let's stand.